my name is Ludovica and I've been living over here for 17 years, but I come from Rome. And uh, that's a really important, it, it, it's a place that has really affected my practice. And although today I'll be talking shortly about exfoliate, cleanse and tone, I actually realise that maybe I should give you an overall impression of what I do. Um, and um, I'm actually going to start from my website so I can, it allows me to jump from one thing to the other. Um, my practice is actually a conceptual practice and I tend to work with archives. So for instance, the archive that I've explored in two peacocks through the makeup department is, is literally one of makeup advertising. But just to give you a little bit of an example of what my modus operandi is, um, for instance, one of the archives that I've been exploring lately is this, which is, this is called the Paninaro Archive, and it's, um, in my practice I really look at hedonism throughout history, um, and in this particular project I've been concentrating on this fashion phenomenon that occurred at the beginning of the 80s in Italy. It's a bunch of kids called the Paninari, which used to meet at Bergi's when Bergi's just opened, and they were so much into Americana that they actually ended up uh, adopting the cheeseburger as their emblem. <laughs> and you know, we're actually talking about Italian culture being so rooted in food that this is just um, how much they embraced the whole thing. And it was also a very naive moment because it was a moment in which McDonald's still hadn't opened, we weren't aware of um, the uh, unhealthy consequences of eating too many cheeseburgers. It was also a moment in which we weren't really thinking about the environment as we think about it today. So it was really a moment in which consumerism was em embraced and highlighted and loved. And, um, and what was also happening is that um, Berlusconi was importing all of these American TV programs. The Paninaro adopted the preppy look as their main style. In the meantime, in Northern Italy, the fashion industry was really thriving and you had all of these uh, fashion houses pretending to produce American products that actually were Italian and had misspelt American names. Um, a, a lot of the aesthetics of it was a very Memphis aesthetic, which is where me and John really meet. Um, in fact, Natalie Dupasque, do you remember when earlier on you were talking about that chair, you didn't know who it, it was by? It's by Natalie Dupasque. She was actually designing the patterns in particular for brands like Nayoleari. Now Nayoleari, which um, th this is a, a genius concept because um, they, they actually promoted this pattern on pattern idea for which you'd buy everything from bed linen to uh, hair bands, um, to costumes, to diaries, to chairs. And everything had a pattern and everything could go with each other. So basically, I think this is the first time that we actually see um, this whole idea of the total brand. And so this is a Paninaro archive, which I've presented in, in these frames. And it actually has like old diary pages of mine. P part of the project started because I found some old diaries and I was just so shocked at, uh, at my relationship with these brands and stuff. Out of this, I also ended up making a large scale installation, which you've seen a shot before um, in, in John's work, which actually spelled Paninaro, and it spelled Paninaro in bubble writing that also I've retrieved from the diaries. And it's actually full of um, Paninaro paraphernalia. Now, the, 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 the way that I've collected this stuff is um, I've partly collected it through eBay, uh, and partly I actually went to um, old friends of mine begging them for stuff. And it's quite interesting because some of them totally, like some of them would give me something, and others, they just have such a fetishistic relationship with the stuff still to today. So they'll have it in the attic wrapped in tin foil, and they won't give it to me, you know. <laughs> but they will never, they actually don't use it, they don't do anything with it. Mm. So 
So for instance, that's an Ayoliadi jacket with all of the little patterns, and um, that's a Best Company shirt. And next to it, where the little hand is, it's actually a Johnny Lambs shirt, which tr translated in Italian is Giovanni Agnelli. That's just, <laughs> that's just how capitalist the whole thing was. <laughs> Yeah, and this is, it just gives you an idea of how the, the letters actually uh, work in space. Now, another thing that I could do, for instance, is um, this is still part of the Paninaro phenomenon. And I, I make these vomitoria, which are, they're a play on the Roman idea that there is a place where um, you know, Romans would binge eat and then liberate themselves, but actually that place is fictional, it doesn't exist. The term is actually an architectural term, and it identifies entries and exits from big stadiums that would allow massive crowds of people to come in and out. What the Romans actually did was they would vomit directly on the floor. <laughs> so this is, this is a, 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 cheeseburger, a pan cheeseburger vomitorium, um, and this is a pan hot dog vomitorium, and um, the, st the stuff that you see here, well, they're actually samples of textiles from uh, Hong Kong, and they, they, there's an entire area in Hong Kong where you can go there and grab all of these textile samples, and effectively, it's a Chinese textile industry that drowned the Italian one, so you could say they marked the end of the paninaro. Another um, archive that I tend to work a lot with is wallpapers. Um, a lot of these wallpapers I'll screen print myself, and others I'll source around the world or I'll find through eBay. Um, and this is something that I've done quite recently at the Foundation Muro. And the, it's called Bomazzo Vertigo because the actual um, image that you can see of it is taken from uh, Bomarzo Park, which is actually probably the first example of an entertainment park. Um, I've also made a Paninaro wallpaper installation. So every time that I make one of these wallpaper installations, um, I tend to look for a subject and expand it. So in this case, for instance, Wild Boys was, of course, one of the main tracks that they were listening to. And there's a day and night mode. So um, during the night, the UV lights pick up on the Berlusconi channels that are Rete Quattro, Italia Uno, and Canale Cinque that were broadcasting all of the um, programs. And like, for instance, a little frog one, that's, that's another very Nayoleari Memphis pattern. Now, okay, which brings me to what I wanted to talk about today. Okay, basically, um, I've started a new archive, and this is, I'd, I'd like to discuss this archive today. And um, in particular, I've been reading a lot of uh, this sociologist called Sigmund Baumann, and he's extremely interesting because he actually looks at what has happened to how consumerism has shifted. And basically, one of the things that he's really into is looking at how we've gone from a society of producers which were our parents and our grandparents, to us, and he identifies us as the society of consumers. Now, the society of producers um, tended to hoard, hoard stuff, and they tended to 
fix things and you know keep them in immaculate condition um, and so the act of consumption consumption revolved more around the idea of having and having locks rather than necessarily seeing the product consumed um, instead like our society is made up of individuals that have the impulse actually to buy and discard their purchase as quickly as they can. Um, and that this, this cycle of consumption relies on constant new acquisitions and their destruction. In fact, if we were just to hoard like our parents would, we actually would not be, we, we wouldn't literally have any more space to consume. That there is actually a, a storage issue. Um, with the society of consumers, there is no longer a problem. The instinct to use up, destroy, discard is as strong as that to purchase. Bauman takes this even further, suggesting that the instinct to annihilate has become in itself a driving force in the cycle of consumption, and that as consumers, we find our ultimate satisfaction in seeing the item purchased being destroyed, which is actually really what I'm interested in right now. Um, one sublimated example of this total annihilation of the thing that we buy um, or its invisibility is through things like second life in which actually people tend to make a lot of transactions like for instance buy a car and they only exist in this virtual environment but they will pay for it as much as in real life so you can buy a car also, the other interesting thing is that it's actually opened up real uh, market possibilities. For instance, um, you buy a house and you'll have a top-notch designer actually come in and decorate your house. So, for instance, people like um, Philips um, are now operating in, in third life and they'll sell you, you know, the whole entertainment system. Um, the consumerist economy thrives on the turnover of commodities and is seen as booming when more money changes hands. And whenever money changes hands, some consumer products are traveling to dump. Accordingly, in a society of consumers, the pursuit of happiness, the purpose most often invoked and used as bait in marketing campaigns, aimed at boosting consumers' willingness to part with their money, earned money, or money expected to be earned, tends to be refocused from making things or their appropriation, not to mention their storage, to their disposal, just what is needed if a gross national product is to grow. For the consumerist economy, the previous focus, now by and large abandoned, portends the worst of worries, the stagnation, suspension of fading or buying zeal. The second focus, however, bodes rather well, another round of shopping, unless supplemented by the urge to get rid of and discard, the urge for more acquisition and possession would store up trouble for the future. Consumers of the consumer society need to follow the curious habits of the inhabitants of Leonia, one of Italo Calvino's invisible cities. And there's a passage that I'd like to read um, on Leonia, which is very interesting. It is not so much by the things that each day a manufacturer sold, bought, that you can measure Leonia's opulence but rather by the things that each day are thrown out to make room for the new. So you begin to wonder if Leonia's true passion is really, as they say, the enjoyment of new and different things, and not, instead, the joy of expelling, discarding, and cleansing. And that's a little bit when um, I started getting interested in these makeup advertising and when I began creating this new archive. I've, I've noticed that it's maybe like six or seven years that um, in these advertising they really destroy the makeup. And um, by reading all of these texts at the same time, I've started pondering on whether <coughs> the destroyed product actually sells the product. So basically, it, it, we've, um, I think marketeers have tapped into the idea that destruction now is a driving impulse, perhaps more than, um, than the act of buying it. Um, and so the, the piece that you have downstairs in, in the makeup counter is, um, is an archive of about two years. And the, the background wallpaper is digital, but the collages are actually cut out from the magazines. And what I do is I offer a recycling service. So I'll go around at friends' place and places and collect all their magazines and then, and then cut them out. 
um, so yeah, this is this is um, a section of the wallpaper. And it's also this idea of um, th th there's, a, there's also something quite bodily in a way about these materials, and it feels like we're also living in a time in which um, the idea of excess and the problem of storage is something that is also addressed in the body. So you know we have to get rid of all excess fat, we have to get rid of the wrinkles. Um, We have to get rid of body odor, um, and so I guess another thing that I'm very interested uh, within the way that we're now consuming is compulsions and addictions. These are these are some other um, works that I've done prior to the Mayor archives, in which I have another archive which is um, fashion portraits in magazines. And I've, I've, I've got magazines from the 60s onwards. And so for a while, I've actually been making these collages in which I layer these advertising. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish by just speaking quickly about this, which is um, wh wh we've seen how part of the problem is storage, and I've begun make, making work by um, using these vacuum forming bags. And it all started because I had a little, little bit of a moth infestation one winter, and my neighbour was like, "Right, you know, if they eat in your sweaters, you take the sweaters, you put them in these bags, and you chuck them in the freezer, and then after." two weeks they die. And I got really obsessed, because I've got really colorful clothes. I used to put them in these bags and then <laughs> suck the air out. And it's, 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 really, it, it's really satisfying process, actually. Um, and so by working with, these, with a lot of these wallpapers, um, when they're wet, they actually behave like textiles. In fact, one of the things that I do is I actually make three-dimensional objects with them. And I started thinking, well, hold on a second. Um, you know, I can actually use this process by bringing the wallpapers or whatever other archive I'm working on within them. So one of the things that I started doing is I started making these rocks, which are a little bit like, they're basically the same rocks that are downstairs. Um, and they are formed by making a collage. And when the, wall, when the paper is still humid, I'll make it into a ball and I'll put it in the vacuum bag and suck the air out. So I'm making these works that are a little bit like an inverse of a landfill. Um, and the way that they're developing um, now is that I've actually started making these bigger ones that are heavier, they're much more like rocks, and they're made out of entire magazines. So for instance, this is a Vice magazine. So I'll rip it all apart, I'll glue it back together. When it's wet, I'll make a ball and I'll put it in a vacuum bag. Um, and this is a topolino, which b belongs to the farinaro. And this is a, a Guardian supplement. And this is a Look magazine. Uh, this is a collection of British gas bills. <laughs> and uh, this is actually... Um, uh, one of the things that also I tend to do in my practice is reuse everything. So for instance, I once did this installation that I can actually show you. Um, which I hand drew over 110 meters of lining paper. And then I took it down, so essentially the work died the moment that the installation finished. But I did keep the off carts and so now I'm making rocks with them. Um, yeah. 
And I'd, I'd actually like to stop at that. It's a short lecture. <laughs> I'm guessing that Victoria has arrived, yes, yeah, Victoria Watson, thank you. Um, we're very lucky that Victoria's been able to come up here today, thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, I think I had a little bit of trouble arriving, but it's good that you've I have to wait for the platform or something, the train has to Ah, uh, right. And um, can somebody... Sure. You put your memory stick in. So those of you who have bought the catalogue will know that Victoria Watson's essay is an excellent one. And uh, Victoria's agreed to talk to Hello. us today. Um, so if you would like to introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, why am I? I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I don't belong. Uh, oh, uh, yes, no, I'm going to talk about... We'll just get the slide show started out. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about department stores and art galleries. So I reckon that more or less sort of ties it in with what's been going on up here over the past well, couple of days. Um, so, uh, so this is, in a sense, this is a, a formal lecture, but it's going to be really fast. So don't worry, because I know you've been sitting here for a long time. Um, so this th this is a design by the architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, that some of you might have heard of, and he produced it in 1927. Seven, and the reason that I'm showing it to you today is because it's a design for a department store. Uh, this, on the other hand, or perhaps it's not on the other hand, this is a design by the same architect which he produced towards the end of his life in the 1960s when he was renowned the world over as a leading architectural thinker. And as I think many of you will know, this is an art gallery. Uh, the new National Gallery in Berlin was probably the most radical art gallery ever to be built, and I would suggest it remains so even to this day, although there have subsequently been other ideas about art galleries prom um, proposed by architects. So Mises Department Store um, is all right, the granddaddy of his art gallery, and it's no coincidence that these two buildings forge a link between the consumption of commodities and the consumption of art. Absolutely no coincidence at all. Now, what interests me about these buildings, uh, and I think should probably be of interest in general in the context of the show downstairs and what you've been talking about today, um, is the particular nature of the spatial environment that they propose and that's what I want to look at in this short talk. Um, however, before I do that, I think it might be useful to clear up some, um, a little misunderstanding that has slipped into the culture of architecture and art, and that's the idea that Mises' architecture fits some art historical labels such as modernist or minimal. Probably a lot of you are sitting there with those kind of vacuous notions in your mind that you might say, I shouldn't accuse you of that. I, in my, own, in my time, have sat there with vacuous notions of the sort in my mind and direct, directed them at me. So, to give an example of what I mean, I'd like to turn to an event that took place in 1992, um, and it was a, a symposium to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Toronto Dominion Centre. This is not the Toronto Dominion Centre. The Toronto Dominion Centre is a large tower slab building in um, Toronto, but again, designed by Mies. Now, one person who had been invited to the, um, the sort of birthday party of this building uh, was the art critic and historian Rosalind Krauss, who some of you might have heard, heard of. She stopped writing now, but she was quite prolific uh, as a writer in the 70s and the 80s. Um, was very much responsible for, if you like, the cultural turn that got... Um, artists and indeed architects thinking about that what they did as being somehow postmodern or post-structuralist as opposed to avant-garde and modern. Um, 
so Krauss was at the, uh, at the time of the conf conference. She was renowned for her writings about for her sorry not write well her, her writings these being readings of the work of so-called minimalist artists such as Robert Morris, Donald Judd, Richard Serra, and Agnes Martin to name but a few. And Krauss began her paper by throwing down a challenge to all the architectural critics and historians in the audience. And she announced, I'm quoting her now, as I was reading some of the recent literature on Mies, we're talking about the 1980s now, as I was reading some of the recent literature on Mies van der Rohe, I encountered a phenomenon I had not known of until then. I came across the politically correct Mies, the post-structuralist Mies, almost, we could say, the postmodernist Mies. Now, paraphrasing what Krauss seems, sorry, paraphrasing Krauss, what seems to have happened is that her ideas from her readings of painting and sculpture had been imported into the culture of architecture where they were being used to transform Mies from a modernist into a minimalist architect. The difference would seem to depend on the interface between the viewer and the artwork. In the case of modernist art, the object strives towards autonomy. The art object strives towards autonomy, standing aloof from the point of view of the spectator, which is understood to be merely contingent. On the other hand, in the case of minimalist work, it is the contingencies that matter. The little shifts in effect and affect that drift across the surface of the work as the viewer's perceptions change over time. As I say, I'm paraphrasing Krauss, paraphrasing herself there. Now, for myself, initially, just why not, I took sides with the old modernist readings of Mies, taking great pleasure in standing against all the varieties of minimalist reading that were so popular at the time, and instead insisting that Mises' art gallery was a modern building. <laughs> Except I knew, having visited the building on numerous occasions, that I was wrong. Mises' art gallery doesn't lend itself either to minimal or to modernist readings. There's something else going on. In trying to put my finger on the nature of this something else, I noticed that my own response to the building was always characterised by the powerful feeling that something is missing. It's what it seems to me to have characterised this particular building by Mies, but Miesian architecture more generally. And then one day I came across Mises' department store design and that was to head my thinking off in an altogether different direction, into a territory where I could leave the classifications of the culture industry behind. So in the years preceding his department store design, Mies had made some breakthrough developments in his thinking about architecture. In 1922, he produced the first of a set of three theoretical projects that would launch him into the world of the architectural avant-garde. And this one is the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper, skyscraper project of 1921. It's a 20-storey block sheathed in glass. The block is extruded up from a plan figure that is triangular in its overall configuration, but is broken into three sub-figures connected to a central core that houses lifts and stairs. So much is evident from the plan. What I want you to notice is the insistent regularity of the spacing between the floor slabs, which mark out a horizontal rhythm cut in regular intervals into the vertical expanse of the air. Now, there's a distinct mood and quality to the skyscraper and its environing context, a kind of broody presence haunts the drawing. Mies had chosen to draw both the new building and the city around it as objects that are empty, silent, and still. This is the second theoretical project, known simply as the Skyscraper Project of 1922. This one is 30 storeys high, uh, the plan figure is curvaceous and there are two centres of circulation. And once again, notice the insistent rhythm of the floor slabs as they slice into the air 
and notice the way that Mies has chosen to draw the building and its context as things that are empty, silent and still. And then the third theoretical project is a little bit different. It's not a skyscraper, but a slab block known as the concrete office building of 1923. And in this case, Mies was experimenting with the idea of the floor slab, and he's trying to imagine what happens if the edges are turned up. And he speculates they will make thick horizontal bands that appear to hover in the air. Between the hovering bands span sheets of glass, organised into long strip windows. Now, although in comparison with the skyscraper designs, the, the concrete office building is stocky and burly, still, nevertheless, there's the same theme of the insistent horizontal ryth rhythm, cutting regular intervals into the air, and the characteristic aura of emptiness, silence, and stillness. And it's precisely these qualities of emptiness, silence, and stillness that have led so many people to equate Miesian architecture in the first instance with modernism and then later with minimalism. Now in doing so, I would like to suggest that they are entirely missing the point. So let's return now to the department store, which is what we're interested in today. Notice how the photomontage captures the same qualities as the early theoretical projects. There's this there's the even rhythm of the floors, there's the same broody presence haunting the image, and there's an aura of stillness, silence and emptiness just generally pervading the photomontage drawing. However, unlike the theoretical projects, which were published in avant-garde journals, where they were accompanied by short aphoristic statements of the kind we all think we know less is more, that's actually not true, but anyway, short <laughs> aphoristic statements. What's interesting about the department store is that it was accompanied by a letter written by Mies to his client, this being the company, nice name, of S. Adam and Sons. Now, in reading Mies's letter, what we can begin to understand, we can begin to understand why he chose to draw the building in the particular way that he did. And what becomes clear is that he wasn't the least bit interested in invoking the sense of some brooding presence. That's not the point of what he was getting at. The reason he drew the building the way he did is because he wanted it to actually look like something was missing. And if we attend to the letter, we can begin to, as it were, retrieve what it was that is miss was missing, or is missing, or is suggested as, as missing in Miesian architecture. So I'll go through the letter quickly. It's divided into four paragraphs. In the first paragraph, Mies introduces the letter as an opportunity to present briefly the thoughts that determined the project. And he then gives a schematic account of the design, justifying the strategy in terms of the professed needs of the client. So he writes, The variability you want is best served by an undivided expanse of the individual floor levels. For that reason, I have placed the supports in the exterior walls. And here Mies justifies a clear and undivided interior for each different floor of the building on the grounds that it satisfies his client's need for variability. In the case of a department store, the variability in question arises from the need to constantly change the displays of goods for sale. As a consequence of the need for variability, Mies is suggesting that the rooms inside the store, far from being differentiated by design, should be homogenised into an undivided expanse. So here again is evidence of Mises' preoccupation with the stage, the stage of an ambience of light and air, rather like the sky or the sea on a clear day. The fundamental quality of the interior spaces of the department store consists in a calm expanse, untroubled by incident. The spaces provided by the architect will be empty, silent and still. Then... In the second paragraph of his letter, Mies admonishes his client for placing taste before purpose. He says, you have indicated in your requirements that in general, a building with vertical articulation would conform to your tastes. May I say in all frankness that in my opinion, a building has nothing to do with taste, but must be the logical result of all requirements that result from its purpose. 
Only if these are established can one speak of the intrinsic forming of a building. You need layered floor levels with clear, uncluttered spaces. Furthermore, you need much light, you need publicity, and more publicity. I want you to notice that Mies has added a further element to the qualities he deems of value to the client. As well as the ambience of light and air, the department store, he's now saying, and by implication the art gallery, needs publicity. But note also, there is no publicity evident in Mies's drawing of the building. Return to the drawing of the building. Publicity is one of the missing components of the Miesian design. In the third paragraph of his letter, Mies reminds the client of the necessity, not only for the architect, but also for the client, to approach the project with a good dose of boldness. And Mies then proceeds to equate boldness of attitude to boldness of design, drawing his client's attention to the boldness of the idea of the enclosing skin of the building, which is to be made out of steel and glass. So he writes, I therefore suggest to you making the skin of your building of glass and stainless steel. With the bottom floor of transparent glass, the others of opaque glass, walls of opaque glass give the rooms a wonderful, mild, but bright and even illumination. In the evening, it represents a powerful body of light, and you have no difficulties in affixing advertising. Now, with the mention of advertising, Mies is once again referring to a quality of the building that he has chosen not to draw. Advertising is missing from the image. However, with the introduction of the idea of the glass and steel skin, Mies' writing is now beginning to express a mild enthusiasm for the imagery of the new department store. He proceeds to write about the daytime image, imagining a person inside the building who feels themselves as if immersed in a mild but bright illumination. Then he writes about the nighttime image and the experience of a person looking at the building from outside, who is confronted by a compelling body of light. Having asked his client to imagine the nighttime character of the building as a body of light, Mies then asks the client to imagine what it would be like if brightly lit advertising were fixed to the building's glowing form. Again, he is asking his client to imagine something that his drawing does not show. In other words, to imagine an aspect of the architecture that is missing from the design. Encouraging, encouraging his client to engage with the proposal, Mies suggests they think of the building as being in some sense like a blank sheet of paper which they can write on. So he says, you can do as you like, regardless whether you write on it for the summer vacation, for winter sports or for bargain days. Such a brightly lit advertising on an evenly illuminated background will have a fairy tale effect. Now, with the idea of the fairy tale effect, we have completely left the broody imagery of the photo montage, and the department store is beginning to seem somehow magical and alive. From the fairy tale effect, the letter leads into the fourth, short, and concluding paragraph, and here, for the first time, Mies evokes the presence of a body of people who will use the building. He writes, your building should bear the character of your business and should fit in with sailboats and with automobiles, or, expressed differently, with the modern times and with people that embody it. Now here, I'm bearing in mind he's writing in 1927, here Mises portraying an image of the building by drawing together two analogies. First, he makes an analogy between the character of the people who will use the building and the character of sailboats and automobiles, which are colourful, lightweight and mobile. Second, he makes an analogy, an analogy between colourful, lightweight vehicles and the kinds of people who use them and who collectively embody modern times. For me, to be modern is to be lightweight, moving and colourful, and the architecture of such a mode of being is reflected, but by no means uh, completely grasped, in a homogeneous ambience of light and air. Reflected, but by no means made complete in an homogeneous ambience of light and air. Now, recently, it's okay, it's nearly over now. Recently, I just want to bring this into the current times, in a show called Content, staged in 2003, a very famous architect called Rem Coolhouse, probably as famous as Mies, if not more so, demonstrated the department store nature of Mies's new National Gallery. Now, unfortunately, 
think it's unfortunately. Critics tend to read Coolhouse's installation as if it is he who has made the 20th century art gallery into a department store. But I hope that my brief excursion into the archives of architectural history has made it clear to you that Mises' art gallery was a department store right from the start. And I'm certain that Coolhouse would be the first to agree with me when I say that all he's doing, all that Coolhouse is doing, at content, was showing the new National Gallery the way it already is. Now, as you might, this is the last one. It's worth attending to that piece of text there on the right. As you might be aware, there's an exhibition of Coolhouse's work now on show at the Barbican Gallery in London. In the exhibition leaflet is this interesting piece of text. I want you to notice how Coolhouse has simply crossed out the word minimal and replaced it with a more up-to-date word from contemporary architecture culture, namely sustainable. In architecture, sustainable is the new minimal, just as modernism used to be the old minimal. The point Coolhouse seems to be making here is that it doesn't much matter which word you use, they are all cover-up words and they all play the same role, which is negative. The cover-up words do not approximate the sublime, scolds Coolhouse, rather they minimise the shame of consumption. Now for me, what's interesting about two peacocks are those aspects of the work that go beyond uh, its, if you like, pretended mockery of the art gallery. Two peacocks is of course showing us that the art gallery belongs to the same typology of a department store. But I think it's trying to, do some, to say something more and this something more is hinted at in John Walter's notion of what he calls the maximal. Now, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with the word maximal because it's so obviously a spoof on minimal. That's sort of partly why it's effective. Um, and it runs the risk of turning into another of these cover-up words. On the other hand, I'm like, I have a look around the show. I have a good feeling about the show. Perhaps one way to describe what I like about the show is hinted at in this expression of cool houses of the approximated sublime. It's quite a nice expression. It strikes me that approximating the sublime rather than absolutizing it is what Mies was getting at in his letter when he writes of the department store as having a fairy tale effect. The approximate sublime as a kind of fairy tale effect is a way of articulating what we are trying to do when we make architecture and or art and I think it's present in some way here in the two people show. Thank you so much Victoria. Can I invite all the speakers to come back to the table to uh, take on any questions that people might have? Um, I might need to bring a chair with you. Okay. One of the um, I think the running um, words to do with con the idea of the consumer um, has, has kind of run through everything and one of the um, questions I have are to do, to do with um, the idea of constructed realities and I think you touched all touched on it in different ways um, I was thinking about the Truman show this morning when mm. I woke up um, and I was thinking about it in relation to what you were talking about John um, where when you talked about putting that white cube inside a church mm. um, and having to then put your work on top of that. So there's a sort of three layers of virtual reality happening yeah. there. And it seems to me that even in our Gallery North, there we are, you know, constructing a kind of minimal art gallery in the middle of, in the midst of a mess of different subject areas and different ideas. Yeah, and, of a, and of a modernist, well, a sort of brutalist building that's got its own character. And, and when you look at the plan, and we had lots of conversations about the plan before the install, and, and walls have been covered, you know, windows have been covered over, and 
it's a fiction, yeah. Mm. I think that as I've gone on with more of these projects, the more I've wanted to, well, either bur um, yeah, mock the fiction or, uh, or go further with it, adding extra piping, extra... Um, I, I personally think that asserting a white cube is a dead end at this point. That there, ha you know, that there's a there's a, there's convent. Well, like you're talking about the Demaxine the Demaxine House mm. and Buckminster Fuller's like um, saying that you do the best with what you've got at a given time. You know, in the 19th century, the salon was the best you could do at that time, and now the white or recently the white cube has been that. But I propose that that's not what we'll be doing in 50, 100 years time. Mm. Not that this is the solution, or but this is maybe the discussion start of it. You know. Well, I think you have to if you can't if you can't allow the idea that the that those the way that you might talk or show art or anything will change, then the thing is fin you know it's got finished. If you mm. can't, if the environment can't be be different or ch you know be adapted or disappear or what have you. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm ready for that. Well, yeah. In a way, like I, I, this is only t tangential, but with the Max, you know, the new Zaha Hadid Museum in Rome, mm. I think there's questions there to be asked because it actually doesn't. It, 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 so, in architecture, what happens with these superstar architects designing new structures for art? I actually don't find them. The Maxi is in some respects a beautiful building, but it doesn't fulfill the function of arts. Like, for instance, the first show that I went there, it, you know, a lot of the spaces mm. don't allow, like, some walls are crooked, yes. and, you know, they actually, so... But, I mean, I, that's, a sim that's an argument that people have been having, you know, they built the Guggenheim, and mm. it's suddenly on a ramp that's and a true. thing, and, and there were, all the true. painters signed a petition that this was the most awful building, should shut it. I mean, I'm not comparing no, the Maxi thing to that at all, but um, and maybe the Guggenheim, that bit of the, that bit of the <coughs> museum, maybe it's just... You know, maybe it's just so good. It's just like a work of art. You know, he wasn't. He, mm. Frank Lloyd Wright said, "Architecture is the mother of all art." He wasn't interested in painters and people making lumps of sculpture. It's a load of old junk. You know, he was interested in his big number. You know, yeah. which I mean, it's kind of. I'm not saying that's all right, but in a way, it kind of actually, if you look at it, it's not so bad. There's a piece of stuff. You know. Yeah. So, no, and I agree. Actually, like it, 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 it imposes a way of viewing the show that is very peculiar and interesting and. I've always enjoyed going there, so maybe 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 there's a new relationship that I will start having with the Maxi that I haven't quite. Um, I wonder there's a, there's an issue of site specificity versus bespoke, which is um, you know it's this whole idea of installation art, which is just really mm -hmm. a different conversation mm -hmm. about how you place things, um, and and it's an issue of macrocosmic or microcosmic. I think that. Um, uh, was I talking about? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, how did I get onto my? Installation art. Oh yeah, installation yeah. versus bespoke. But I think that um, we inherit these spaces that somebody else has designed, and maybe we need to build the space for the work, and then make the work. Well, I don't know. Why, why are we? We're making paintings or or transportable things. I mean, not all of us, but and and actually, maybe, maybe rather than making an installation, you. You make an object and then you build a space for it, or things like that. I don't think we're trying hard enough. But in a way, Victoria, you're you're kind of arguing the other way around in terms of the architect that the architect Van der Rohe was was thinking about what was going in there and thinking about the humanity and the mess that would actually interact with the building and make it into something, and that the building had to step back from itself. I don't, I don't know whether you would call it mess, mm. but certainly the idea that the, the building was not the architecture, although it, mm. it, it, it mirrors the architecture, the architecture being something that is more, if you like, socially produced. Yes, but I think, in, but in terms of the, uh, but then going back to the, the, the question about the, you talked about constructed realities and, and an artist mm. placing mm. work in given environments. Um, and then, but isn't there, isn't there, isn't there, isn't there a, a question that precedes that, which is, well, what, what, what are the social relationships of the artist in the 21st century? What, what, who's asking for this art? Mm. Where is it being asked for? Where's the, where is, where are the demands for it coming from? Where is its necessity? 
before you start worrying about. I mean, yeah. well, those should t- those would tie it. into because yeah. cr- it would be quite ironic, wouldn't wouldn't it, if we had this beautiful if we had the Mies van der Rohe department store, which really is just this sort of beautifully irradiated, homogenous am- ambience of light and air, and then all your art is in sort of I don't know the damn back alleyways and in toilets and yeah. in leftover spaces and in the backs of sheds in people's gardens. Mm. Um, it, it, it actually I quite like that image. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. It's yeah. Sort of, <laughs> It's quite, yeah. <laughs> I think in a way the answer is nobody's asking for it and that's the dilemma and that you have to, and I, I think the part of my, what I was talking about earlier was about, yeah, where, where does it fit in the world? Like you, you can put it in your flat or you can store it, you know, and this issue of storage is really um, going to affect me when this all comes back to London and I have to live with it again. Um, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I think we... We, we start making stuff without a home for it. Well, unless you're a designer, is it, there is a different pur- purpose there, isn't there? Because you're filling a need that's been identified, whereas the artist doesn't necessarily... And I don't mean to make those distinctions, and, you know, we talked about that, but um, the artist is making something without purpose in that sense. The yeah, but I think architecture gets it wrong by trying to... They assume what something is, you know. They, mm. they make an assumption about what art is, and then think, "Oh, I'll make a thing for what I think art is," you know. And I don't. I mean, there's obviously some spaces that were made for other things work very well for maybe showing art, or but perhaps they do. I don't know whether they really do, but um, like the Baltic thing or the Tate. I mean, they're just they're big, unusual buildings built for very specific purposes. One was a power station, and one was for keeping flour in, or whatever. Mm. So you get these kind of get some kind of drama that people then think, well, it's okay to show art in that. I mean, maybe that's all right. I'm not saying it's bad, but it'd be nice if we could make new places. I mean, I haven't seen the Maxi building, but it'd be nice if we could make new places which were somehow... Mm. It's very specific like that, but for something that you don't know what it is, I don't know. I mean, that's where the Mies thing is interesting, because it's absolutely trying to make some great work. And, and I don't think it's a bad place for seeing art. Everyone moans about, what, oh, there's nowhere to put... Well, there's plenty of... I don't know. He puts it all underground. Yeah. We've mm-hmm. got some other <coughs> things to ask. Can I just ask you, in the question of designing spaces for art, mm. certainly in the, the, the practice of art has taken the build about a response at the moment in time, and that mm. the nature of that practice changes very much in tune with a moment, and architecture is a much slower business. And so, is there not a conversation to be had between the, the speeding up of either the speeding up of the architect process of architecture to respond to the practice of art if there isn't real data, mm. or um, you get a situation where the, the, the housing of art is, is, is immediately archival because mm. it's a museum. So therefore, you're you're not making art for a space; you're making art a space to keep art. Um, and I just wonder. Yeah, because I also wonder uh, the issue of the dissociation of the formal, uh, the fun- the functional and the functionless was a, a question at issue when we started this. And that, um, you know, if you look back to the Renaissance and the relationship between the artist and the architect, it's much closer. And those things are built together at the conception. It's the same person, very often. And I think that um, this idea that these disciplines would be separated. Is very is fairly recent and possibly not helpful, um, and, and and I don't mean to overplay collaboration, but maybe it's that what well, is will touch on it. I think that we should give ourselves permission to be to do everything, and maybe you do it badly, but maybe you do it better than letting somebody else do it for you and getting your thing wrong or something. I don't know. That's something. That, I don't know. Mm. It, yeah, there's something about subversion, though, isn't there? Mm. I mean, without the white cube, there's no subversion going on downstairs, yeah, is there? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, we have these kind of cathedrals we set up mm. for uh, subjects, for, for areas, and, and then we subvert them in some way. Um, I wonder if anybody's interested in the collaborative aspect of the work that's going on down there, because it seems to me that there is... Uh, that's another area that um, you've explored this morning um, that is to do with um, a lack of um, acknowledging authorship in a very different way 
mm. um, a kind of common authorship. Um, and I, I felt as a, a, a viewer that I, I could understand that work in relation to my life, even though um, you know, the objects in it uh, had, had um, came out of a very particular <coughs> aesthetic uh, mm. that wasn't my own. Um, I wonder whether particularly younger, a uh, younger audience is, is, is what is, that is directed at and what, mm. what, it, what that is about. For me, it was about um, not really believing in group shows, you know, finding them quite fake, you know, there's a theme dogs in art or something <laughs> so who's been doing dogs lately you know it all feels a bit <laughs> stupid really so I thought well, what, what's dogging a genuine yeah dogging in art <laughs> what's a genuine way of doing it which is to have conversations with people so that uh, and, and also asking people on board who I trusted their whole oeuvre like I say and then um it, the, the, I mean, this is covered slightly in the catalogue, so I don't want to repeat it, but uh, hosting people, uh, that, all, all the people that were involved in the project at the flat, at my flat, having drinks and dinners, coming up here on a site visit, using myself as a, a social instrument in order to create the uh, vocabulary for the install to run smoothly, which is what, on Monday morning, you could feel this energy field of everyone knowing exactly what they were doing, not in a it's been thought through to the nth degree kind of way, just that there was a, a syntax there between the participants which didn't depend solely on me. There was a, there was a shared sense of responsibility, I mm -hmm. think. And an ongoing dialogue. I mean, yeah. it's one that is going to stretch <coughs> into um, Corinne's educational projects and um, into events surrounding the exhibition. You know, and the relationships that are, uh, are established, some are older, some are, are new to this project and hopefully extend out. So, so this project is a stop-off point within a bigger trajectory, hopefully, mm -hmm. for those participants involved. And that certain collaborations like mm -hmm. Ludovica and Corinne's make-up things are things that have come out of this that are completely unexpected, but are, are, are really wonderful and are intriguing to see how they develop or not, but that's the luxury of the position, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the, the idea of, of it being a dialogue and being a, an ongoing conversation and it happening in, uh, you know, you, you visited friends and taken their makeup magazines and so on. There is a, a kind of living in that you were talking about, Will, where people um, aren't just an artist but they have a life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that life enters into the work um, and enters into the building and so, and so on yeah um, I mean I don't I mean, yeah because I don't I mean some people set, make a very big separation between the way that they operate their lives and work which is I think there's no it doesn't matter that's one way of doing things you know Tony Hancock in The Rebel threw away his bowler hat and then left on a boat and went to Paris to hang out with existentialists and so he had an idea about being with a group of people that seemed to be doing sharing the same life. But I suppose it's just that the idea that you shouldn't you should know that your the way that you operate yourself as a maybe as an architect and artist is the way that it could operate. I mean, the trouble with something like architecture is it's professionalised. You know, it's the architecture profession who is like a it's protectionist. You know, so they want to keep. So someone like Buckminster Fuller, architects still in architecture schools, they're really sniffy about him because he's like, he's just a bit, bit off, you know. It's like some of that stuff's a bit kind of like, ooh, a bit strange, um, or a bit horrible, you know, a bit sort of futuristic. But, and I think that's not. I think you know you have to. Why not just act as, as John said, as a sort of? Would you just said something called like a social agent? Yeah, no, as a kind of something like that. I don't a know. Just, yeah, but just and just actually, so you know, open open you. Mate, if you're interested in a good bar, then just open the bar. If you're interested in good books, making good books that you think are good books that no one else will publish. I mean, maybe no one else will buy, but I mean, I think you have to, that's what you have to do or something. Yeah, like and that. also, you know, you, you're sat there 
and you're having your, your show that nobody came to and you're thinking, well, how do I get, how do I get further or improve this or be successful, whatever that is, and, and, and you, rather than trying to fit the thing you see, mm. you say, well, who do I, who, who, what, what am I doing anyway? Who am I with anyway? And, and who do I have dinner with anyway? And that's your audience. That's the group. And that's all. If, if you start being too self-conscious, then it's, it's trapped and it's withered already. So what this was about was knowing Will and, and certain other people or certain other people that I wanted to work with, but not in a, I want it to be this, uh, a kind of gratuitous um, a calculation that if I did dun 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 dun, dun I get that. Oh, look, you know, that actually, let's just do it for us. Mm-hmm. And then it might be interesting to somebody else, but it might not be, which is how I start on my own work anyway. So then to try and expand that context just by, yeah, ex- expanding friendships. Um, There's a, a moral stance there, isn't there, I think? Um, mm. And I got very strong moral stance from Ludovica's presentation. Yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm, you know, repulsed and attracted to consumerism. So, I mean, that there is a critique in, mm. in my practice, so I don't, actually, I don't just embrace the department store. No, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that that's a module that we, you know, that's so inherent in our life that we can't divorce from it, but it doesn't mean that I'm just going to take it and love it. Mm. And if you continue with that, um, and you continue with your stance, which is, I'm not going to take this shit of being supercilious to people when they come in the art gallery, I'm going to make them welcome, yeah. like I would my house, or, yeah. you know, yeah. um, then that, that is going to impact, isn't it, inevitably, so. on the yeah. way that people think about art and art Well, galleries. certainly, you know, it mm. did last night, yeah. I think hopefully we'll see the footage later, and mm. the, the way people behaved, the way the, way the gallery felt, was yeah. it was a nice atmosphere, mm. and... Uh, that's a better place to start from because th- there isn't, you know, pe- I, don't, I don't make what I don't make things just for artists to look at. Uh, that's not to say that it's the lowest common denominator. I'm not Jack Vetriano either, <laughs> but uh, not to single him out. He's a very good artist. <laughs> but um, I think that I want. I, I don't believe that art is complicated and that there's some, you know, yes, it's moving, it's spiritual, it's m- imaginative, it's emotional. But those aren't things that special people have those are things that everyone has and so you do you lure people into that by giving them hooks of the everyday and then they can all enjoy it mm. it's just, i'm a socialist mm. i've said it <laughs> <laughs> but does it not then puzzle you that um, a vast percentage of the population are not if you like artists <laughs> why doesn't everybody do it well, yeah, but... I don't understand why everybody doesn't Yeah, do but, uh, yeah, you were talking about your auntie yeah. not recognising that she was an artist and yeah. she's done these fantastic translations of your work. Yeah, felt. I, don't think, I don't think she is an artist. I'm not, and my argument isn't that everyone's an artist. I don't yeah. think everyone is an artist. I think everyone can enjoy art. I don't think everyone does need to make... I, I feel compelled to deal with the world by making stuff because that's just my the way I've solved the problem. Um, and and my, mine is a holistic approach where the flap, the clothes, the work, the food, it's all the, it's all the one thing. And that, that most people can't do that because they, it, it's quite a big deal to do that, you know. Yeah, but Will was arguing that everyone could do that, I think, right, yeah. That should, we should be that. I, don't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. T- yeah, I wouldn't tell them what they should do. I just think that yeah, everyone could do it. I mean, I don't. I think there's no. I yeah. wouldn't make that distinction. I mean, there is an art to being a nurse. There is an art to being. Yeah, of course there. Is. I mean, like mm. anything. That's what I mean about if you take mm. on a bunch of, if you got some artists and other people, which they historically have been involved in building huge buildings and being involved in transport systems. I mean, it's not. I don't. I'm not joking. I mean, I think it's a way yeah. of thinking about things which specialised areas do not deal with, you know, engineering this, is, they're very specialised and mm. some, Buckminster Fuller's interest in architecture was the fact that it was a very generalist discipline, it deals with economics, with structures, with art and with people, you know, and 
that's the, that's his interest, and it deals with energy. It deals with it's just a general thing. And actually, architecture as a training is a very generalist discipline. If that's not an oxymoron, it's like a you're not a specialist in something. You mm, don't yeah. do the engineering of the building. You just have an idea of how it might work. You don't do all the numbers of the building, but you you should do, and you could do, and you know. So it's a kind of and the idea of generalist is what has been done down as an idea. Polymath, yeah, which you know, is, or Da Vinci, or whoever yeah. it is, where. Yeah, they do everything. Yeah, they don't take. They don't just receive whatever somebody, somebody, some specialist comes in and tells them is the right way of doing it. They question it. They, they, they do a bodge job maybe. Yeah. But they, they did their own version of yeah. it. And it makes more sense as an entirety then. Mm. Yes, Rachel. What do you mean in the sense that art has escaped it, what, in a Rothko sense of being spiritual? Or yes, I mean, do you think art is consumed in the same way as products are consumed that, that has escaped? No, I don't think art is consumed in the same way. You know, if you go yeah, to Stratford Westfield, it's just a complete, it is, well, it is Stendhal syndrome. You want to collapse, it's so confusing. <laughs> um, but I'm also intrigued in that, you know, that's what you get if you go into Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, you know, that kind of Baroque excess, that there is an, there is an emotional impact to that confusion, which is liberating. But I... Um, what about I, the art fair, though, that you think... The art fair is vulgar, yeah. yeah but they think that the art fair, in some respects, is a little bit like Westfield. Mm, absolutely, in that commercial aspect, yeah, I mean, this isn't a department store, this is a metaphorical department. <laughs> the function of the department is a quasi-department store, but, um, yeah, you're, the, the, the art fair there is the it better doesn't, example. It doesn't say that on the... Yeah, <laughs> <it's> a quasi <laughs> <laughs> That's the next one. It's a better publisher's <laughs> store. Um, yeah, there is a problem with that. There is a problem with the commercial aspect of it. Maybe that's it. I, I guess Jeff Koons yes. challenged it, didn't he? He said, you know, don't be ashamed of yeah. your interest in tasteless, gawky kind of knickknacks. Um, but I think, yeah, the department store goes a little bit <coughs> further in a different direction, doesn't it? Um, it's. Um, because it's not about glorification. No. Jeff Koons glorifies. Yeah. And this is about something else. And also, I think um, we've we've um, we've just gone through a big per period in which there's been a rise of minimal mini minimal austere chic art, mm. and that has very much to do with uh, um, like wanting to run away from Jeff Koons and embracing a very sort of like moralistic and austere stance towards stuff. So colour has gone out, mass has gone out, you know, you use materials that you can immediately access and it costs nothing to produce. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. mm -hmm. I suppose my response to your question is that um, the department, it relates more to what we were talking about, these microcosmic worlds, that the department store is my current understanding of it, but, and the space station has been another and that's a conversation that Victoria and I have been having on a project we've been working on. But I'm interested in, yeah, um, it, it's not, it's not, the, it's not specifically about the department store. It's more about what um, taking taking this new fiction on board allows you to do in shifting what the gallery can be and what the on what the group show can be. And just using that as a device to riff off has been really <coughs> useful. It's only, a, it's only a small shift, but it's enabled it to happen differently and hopefully triggered, triggered enough of a shift that maybe I get a bit further into what this might be I'm 
investigating. Mm. Um, I mean, I wonder whether um, the, the difference between the Jeff Koons notion of consumerism and, and what you're producing is, is to do with the uh, British conceptualist uh, uh, ideology that runs through most of contemporary art in Britain at the moment. Mm. And I think that what this does is impact on on the way that art is made in a very particular way. Mm. Um, so that it's 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 not packaged in the same way. No, absolutely. Um, and, and certainly it's not meant for the same art market. I think that this issue of authorship mm. is really key and it wouldn't have worked as well as it has done if people weren't willing to um, risk their authorship being ignored, mm. which I don't think it does actually. I think what it highlights is you, we didn't need labels. We, you can see where somebody starts and ends and the conversations between the pieces become important. And I was surprised even as you know, the organiser of it, <laughs> at how many rhythms and rhymes there were created, some prior to arriving, some purely during the install, like Matt's wallpaper, in my interventions on that, and putting mm -hmm. Corinne's Mondrian's on that. Um, yeah, those are the kind of decisions that that device has accessed. Mm. Now, I, I, I do have a question. Is is all the like could could this be read as a three dimensional mm. version of one of your paintings? <laughs> That's well, what I read it. I and, don't. And the other, the yeah, other question is, what would happen if uh, because like there are bits of conject there are con moments in which you interact over the work which are rhythmical, mm. right, and appear all over the show, yeah. right? And that's, what, that's why I read it as a three-dimensional version yeah. of one of your paintings. And that's my, that's my question, what, what happens there in terms of... Um, in terms, in terms of, of what? Authorship. Well, when someone buys well, it, yeah, it's better no, words. <laughs> do, do you feel like you've been had? Yeah. No, 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 because I've resisted you, you see. I've really resisted yeah, you. Yeah, I know you have, and, uh, yeah. And, um, and, and that's why I'm asking this, because... Um, so, for instance, what if I wouldn't have resisted you? That actually starts becoming an homogeneous aesthetic that takes over, and I think that's problematic. I don't think it has become a homogeneous <laughs> aesthetic it all over. It hasn't, but because, yeah. because like, there's But not only because you've resisted it. No, no, of course <laughs> not. Yeah. Because I think that that's what's been interesting, is that um, where people have been willing to... I have used my methodology as the conjunctive, that's not curation. That is megalomaniacal. <laughs> that's not in dispute. But that's, uh, that's how I could approach this project. And that isn't appropriationist. It's contrapuntal. And it's, a, it's not, and it's not uh, institutional critique either. And I don't think it is a failure that you have resisted it but I would have also have liked to have intervened more, or because that's, that's just how I am. I'm concerned. Can, 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 can I just ask can the I just, Can I just say, it should be John Walters, <laughs> two, two peacocks, quasi, <laughs> storm, okay? So just say so you Well, know. you see, I don't agree, you see, as a member of the audience. Okay. I, I, another member of the audience, I, I walk in there, and um, after a while, I begin to see very particular authors coming through in right. different ways and yeah you mm. are allowing each other into your each of your worlds um, but my sense last night was that the reason that people were interacting with it in the way that they did and were slowly becoming more and more involved in going down the slide and mm. playing the golf and so on was because they were enjoying having a knowledge of each bit of it, uh, and, and I, and I, yeah, don't, that, I mean, am I wrong? I, what, what do people think? I, I think it all depends on your individual authenticity. Mm. Mm. That's an idea that's really, really important to us as, as art students here, because um, you, you've all got, you've all got your own things that you're working with, but in a sense, you are the ringmaster mm. in a good sense. Mm. Um, in that you've teased out everybody's um, 
individual practice, but each one of you is working in a sense with the past mm. and with things that we can recognise as belonging to a different time. Oh, right. I, I, that's very yeah. interesting, actually. I hadn't heard of that. So this is something that you really see yeah, in, in all of the practices. Yeah, definitely. There's all, authenticity in each one. And I think that's why, to, you know, to be blunt, really, every one of you has looked at John when you're doing your presentation today. <laughs> you're looking for his, am I doing it right? Is this what you want? <laughs> it's a constant check. And we were all doing that last night as well at the <laughs> room. You know, we're looking towards you in the bar with your we wonderful got. hairdo. And you, you were the, the host. It is much more like a, a party where you come to a party with your individual things that you think you can talk about, but you interact differently once you're there. Mm. So but you bring your history. Are the, are the roles exchangeable? That's one of my questions yeah. as well. I mean, as in, as in, what would happen if, if you weren't the ringmaster? Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, but this is another question. No. Which, which is, what would have happened if one of you hadn't been part of it? One of you, you know? hadn't been part yeah. of it. Yeah. I think it would have been very different without you or without Michael or without Wait, Ollie. See, I'm not sure about know. that because in Space Station Zadza, I'm actually beginning to see if that's why you talk about maximalist methodology. <laughs> you know, probably this is your personal methodology. Um, and I actually, <coughs> like a lot of the artists that are, are very interchangeable, like, you know, it could have been someone else instead of... Yes and no. There, there are certain people who I, you know, I am a serial collaborator with. Right, like Jamie. Yeah, or Will or Corin yeah. or, you know, yeah. and, the, and yes, I, d I do think it's a movable feast to a certain extent. And then, you know, I have preferences for, you know, there, were, there, there was somebody that was going to be in the show at the start and, and wasn't. And my, my, my answer is that that's to do with the long build up time to it. So that it, 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 it feels like you couldn't take somebody out because they've, it's been so gelled together over mm -hmm. such a long period. Now, if, it, if, if you had changed the cast earlier on, you would have still gelled, I would have, I would have still gelled it together in the same, it would have yeah. become a different yeah. thing. Yeah, but it would have to have and it. And my other question, sorry, because this is all, like, you know, very interesting stuff that, um, why, because, like, for instance, if, if I think of something similar, not similar, but, like, with a remotely similar <coughs> approach, it would be a, a, a people like Asume Vivi, that sort of focus. And they're actually a collaborative group, mm -hmm. and what they do is, you know, sometimes, or, or even like gelatin, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they're four, sometimes they're six, sometimes they're eight, sometimes they're twenty, mm -hmm. but they don't. Um, they act under a pseudonymous, and this expands, and and you're actually choosing the sort of question that I have. You're choosing to remain John Walter. Uh, yeah. What, what, what because it, exactly in response to what I said to your question earlier, which is it's not homogenous. This isn't an all over painting. I'm not scattered evenly through it. Other people spread through it too. Some you're clustered, somebody else is diffused. Mm -hmm. It's there's tension that it's a composition. It's not that this is um an I mean it is an exploded one of my paintings in one sense, but it's more that I use the space as a composition in the way that I would make a painting, and I and I use you as a guest and Will and so and so as parts to deploy within the space as um, ingredients, and so I don't. I'm not a collectivist. I'm not a joiner. I'm I'm an individualist. That's why it's contrapuntal rather than um, it isn't it is collaborative, but it's not. We're not a group. You know, and I, I think, think yeah, I yeah think we're going to have to Sorry. stop there. This is getting really interesting, <laughs> and I'm sure let's be stop it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Should give them time to cool a little bit before this afternoon when there's going to be another panel discussion uh, uh, with a different set of uh, artists. This afternoon, uh, we have um, straight after lunch at one o'clock, one thirty. Uh, John is going to give a tour of the show. And uh, are you going to be all right with a large crowd? Yeah. Like this, yeah. Okay, <laughs> It'll be quite great. funny. Yeah. Um, and then at two o'clock, there is a screening of the uh, event that was last night's opening, uh, which very kindly Kim has, um, has come here. No, not yet, but she's going to be putting it together over lunchtime. Uh, and so she, she will be here to talk to you about that if you want to um, see her. 
And then there will be a panel discussion from 2.30 till 4 o'clock. And that will be with Victoria, but also Diana Taylor and Corin Felgate and Michael Whitby. Uh, so slightly different uh, dynamic there. And uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.